Think of your friends for a moment. Think of their faces. Think of the times you've shared. Now ask yourself this. Could there be a reason out there? Any reason? Any situation? Any reward valuable enough for them to straight out quit your friendship? Now imagine a world in which reasons that would be good enough for anyone to turn against his friends linger around every corner on a day-to-day -day basis. Think of this, and maybe you'll know what it is like to walk in Tommy D'Angelo's shoes. Welcome to Yield Entertainment. My name is Alex, and it is my duty, my mission, my purpose in life to help you decide whether that game that you have been thumbing for so long is indeed the right game for you or not. And today I think we've got one that many of you Mafia freaks have been thumbing for ages, and that is Mafia, a game that came out originally in the year 2002, that now has what they've called a definitive edition. But is this remastered version of the 2002 original worth the time and money? Is it an over-scripted action game that has been deceitfully marketed as a Grand Theft Auto Gangster Edition? Or is the truth, as it is often the case, somewhere in between? Let's find out, shall we? As you know, I read games according to a system of categories that feels relevant to the genre of the game at hand. And the game at hand at this time is Mafia, the definitive edition. A film that is occasionally interrupted by sequences of action. I don't yet have a video explaining our system of categories for action games. But just in case you want to know where these numbers come from, I'll leave the spreadsheet in the description below. You'll probably agree though that gameplay and level design are the most important things in an action game. So let's start there. Let's say you're like me. You're big on mafia and gangster stories. You've watched every film and documentary that's come out on the topic. And of course, you were excited that a game simply called Mafia was coming out. But it turned out that when it did come out, Neither the footage nor the review sounded too convincing, so you decided to give it a pass. For 18 years. And last year, this definitive edition remake of the game came out. You scoped it out, and it seemed to you like this was a mafia-themed GTA kind of game. If this sounds like you, the least I can tell you is that, for better or for worse, the single-player campaign of Mafia is nothing at all like GTA. There's no open world waiting for you to go out on a murder rampage, stealing weapons and executing heists. There's no living the thug life, acquiring new suits and weapons, no stores on which to spend your ill-begotten money. There's nothing of the sort. Mafia Definitive Edition is actually very much the contrary of all of this. You play Tommy D'Angelo as he goes from being a regular cabbie, running fairs for everyday citizens in the fictional city of Lost Heaven, to becoming a top man within the Salieri crime family. The game is structured in chapters. These chapters tell a story, and they very heavily rely on cinematic cutscenes. In these chapters, you're asked to go out on missions that go from busting cars to assassinating politicians. But to say that the game holds your hand would be a monumental understatement. It more like grabs your wrists and leaves bruises on it as it drags you from quest marker to quest marker, not only telling you exactly where to go and what to do every step of the way, but often telling you how to do it. So you're asked to go to a gentleman's club and to find the manager can't be bothered to explore the establishment, which is huge, well-designed, and filled with curious things you wouldn't mind fiddling around while you search for clues. Ain't nobody got time for that! And that's why Mafia's got you covered, with the big, fat, golden square shining on top of the bastard's nugging. Got any doubts on how to smash that car over there? Fear not, your friend Polly's there to tell you exactly what to do. Let's get to these cars. Take your back and start swinging. And if you're too dumb to even understand what he's saying, you still have that big fat text there to make sure you don't fuck it up. Better yet, it tells you how many cars you have to wreck with your bat and how many you must set on fire with your Molotov cocktails. Use a Molotov and let's see some flame. The gameplay in Mafia consists of brawling, parkouring if you would, gunfight, and driving. Lots and lots of driving. And then there's combinations of the above that are meant to keep the gameplay diverse. The problem with this is that, well, none of it is very good. Fist fights are laughable. They're like a poor man's version of The Witcher 3's boxing, which was already pretty mediocre. Boxing is all about using two keys, one to block and one to punch. Spamming the blocking key will always get you to block correctly, regardless of where you're standing or the direction in which you're facing. And the same thing goes for punching. Tommy will do 70% of the job for you, so don't worry about getting it wrong. Gunfights are the best part of the game, but they are most certainly nothing to write home about. You have no control over your companions, and your arsenal is limited to revolvers, automatic pistols, tummy guns, rifles, and lubaras. 
There's no sniper guns, bazookas, flamethrowers, or submachine guns of any type. You can carry two weapons and you can alternate between them, but there's little tactical value in using one or the other. The Tummy Gun, for example, was known for spraying bullets like a shower crown without any precision whatsoever. In Mafia, they can be surprisingly accurate if you tap shoot while keeping the crosshairs on your enemy. The rifle is a little better for close combat, but not significantly better than firing 4 or 5 shots from your regular pistol. You also have Molotov cocktails and grenades, but they are only used as AoE damage sources rather than tactical tools to maybe force your enemies out of cover. Forget about flanking or suppressing fire, none of that makes a huge difference here. And even if it did, it's not like your dumbass allies are going to play along with any of these tactics. Driving, as it is often the case in these games, is both the best and worst aspect of the game. Tommy's a cabbie at the beginning of the game, so your job is to find cab fares and get people to places. This is meant to serve as a tutorial for the driving in the game. That would be all fine and dandy if it weren't for the fact that every car you drive in Mafia handles very extremely different from the one before. So you'll always have to go through a learning curve that goes from uncomfortable, when all you have to do is drive people around, to straight out infuriating when you have no time to learn how that particular vehicle handles because you've got to chase someone. Mafia Definitive Edition kept reminding me of the Saboteur, and worse yet, making me wish I were playing that game instead. The Saboteur is a GTA-like game that takes place in the early 40s, in Nazi-occupied Paris. The Saboteur has a main story and scripted missions, but also plenty of liberty to do whatever you wish between missions, from stealing cars to killing Nazi generals to sabotaging this tower or that propaganda loudspeaker, etc. There's driving, climbing, fighting, shooting, bombing, and swimming. None of it was smooth, sure, but all these things felt like tools in a shed for you to use at your convenience. There were perks to be unlocked and cash to be farmed and spent in new guns, explosives, and ammo. There were different cars, sure, and there were significant differences between them. But for 90% of them, it was just a matter of jumping in and driving. For example, both games have a race mission, and while the race mission in the Saboteur left me wishing there were more missions like it, the race mission in Mafia made me want to shoot the developers in the face. There were many mandatory missions in the Saboteur, but whether you disguised yourself as a Nazi soldier to sneak into a building, climbed your way into the second floor, or went in all guns blazing, whether you ran your target over with your car, sniped him from a distance, or bombed him to hell and gone, was all your choice. In Mafia, you're being chased by a police tank, and you're prompted, and also instructed by Polly just in case, to shoot its machine gun turret, and only its machine gun turret, and you have to do this with your tummy gun, and only with your tummy gun, and failure to do that exact thing in that exact way results in failure, and having to reload from the last checkpoint. In the Saboteur, running around doing sight missions could get you cash. Cash you could use to buy weapons and ammo, and yes, you could bring any gun or a car you might have already acquired into any mission. In Mafia, you start every mission with your two same weapons of choice. You may choose your car, sure, but choosing a car is the most pointless thing ever, as 90% of the time, when it's time for the getaway at the end of the mission, you'll be forced into using a different vehicle. I can't help but think that gameplay in Mafia Definitive Edition was a wasted opportunity. The city is huge and very extremely cool looking. Some of the locations that you can actually get into are amazing, like the city's art gallery or the local bank. Also, your character already has climbing, shooting, sliding, running, and fighting animations. Mafia had all the ingredients for a cool story-based open world game with sandbox gameplay. Unfortunately, the devs decided to go for a very extremely scripted and generic action game instead. Character creation and progression. There isn't any. You play Tommy D'Angelo and, gameplay-wise, he remains the same during the duration of the game. I think Mafia would have benefited from a gameplay more akin to the Saboteur, and if that had been the case, unlockable perks and skills would have been in order. But Mafia has none of that, and I found that to be disappointing. It's not like this is unheard of in the genre. The Batman Arkham series, God of War, and almost every other game in the genre has some form of leveling up system. All of them except Mafia Definitive Edition, that is. But there's no point in ranting about an aspect of the game that is not even present. So I'll just say, albeit reluctantly, that it simply does not apply. Secondary Mechanics to say that collecting magazines, choosing your car at Ralphie's, changing the radio station on your car, or reading some of the newspapers that are scattered around counts as secondary mechanics would be laughable. There's no item enhancement, trading, or customization of items in Mafia Definitive Edition. So let's say this category does not apply, and let's leave it at that. Story and lore. Listen, I know that I said the story in Shadowrun Hong Kong was one of the best stories ever written. I know I said that the story in Desperados 3 made me feel young again and whatnot, and that I praised what remains of Edith Finch for the way in which it conveys its overarching themes and lessons. So I wouldn't blame you for thinking that I'm easily impressed with stories in video games, but trust me, I'm not. 
I'm really not. And trust me in this, the story in Mafia is one of the best stories ever told in a video game. Last year it smoked everything else out of the water, but I also think that the story in Mafia stands as an example of the fact that for quite a while already, the best stories have not been told in movies or TV series. On the surface, the story in Mafia would seem like your standard fair gangster story, one that you've seen played out a dozen times in many of Martin Scorsese's films and television series like The Sopranos. And yes, this is the story of one regular Joe named Tommy D'Angelo who eventually earns a name in a crime family. This story ships with all the classic tropes of the genre. The protagonist comes to realize that the fuck life is not really what he wants. That was when I saw the cost. What it meant to be on the inside. <laughs> I should have took off there and then. But I couldn't go back to being a nobody. But then I got to thinking about something. What good? It was all of Morello's money if it couldn't protect him from a regular Joe like me. Cabby, for Christ's sake. It only got him one thing. A great big bullseye in his fucking forehead. And that thought, it just kept turning round and round in my head until one day, I'm looking in a mirror. I start seeing a bullseye too. Right here. The half-assed lessons of life coming from the dawn. No bus, no trouble at all. Got something else for me? All these feels a little light. There's a little extra in mind to cover the difference. You ever go swimming, Tom? Been to the shore a few times, sure. I knew a couple of guys once. Took some dames out to the lake. Had a few beers, a few laughs. Then one of them decides to go in the water. Gets to the center of the lake and realizes he's running out of steam. Can't make it back in. He starts shouting for help. Now the other guy, he's a strong swimmer. He goes out in the lake to drag his buddy back to shore. Problem is, the first guy, the one too stupid to know when the water's too deep for him, he panics. Grabs his friend by the neck and they both go under and don't come up again. Paulie's your friend, and I know you're loyal to him, and I respect that. But don't you ever pay his tab again. Okay, boss. And of the lesson that one does not simply leave the family. But the gold and diamonds are in the details here. At first, Tommy's a regular Joe who's trying to get by as best he can. Even after spending some time as a member in the Salieri crime family, Tommy and his friends are still depicted as ignorant, uneducated simpletons who might have become streetwise from all their deeds, but still show all of the insecurities and uncertainties of those who haven't had access to education. Tommy's actions, dialogue lines, and even facial expressions make it abundantly clear that he knows the difference between right and wrong. I want to pop you, Tommy. No. No, no, wait. Please. Please, I don't want to fucking die, man. Christ, Tom. You can't feel sorry for these animals. A guy like this would plug you if you give him the chance. You gotta pull the trigger without thinking. Yes, I'm out. This one's finished, too. <sighs> oh. oh, Christ, Tom. Snap out of it. Do you remember what those guys wanted to do to Sarah? Yeah. Just, uh... Hey. You can tell that he struggles with his own morality. He's adopting Thomas, who ends up choosing to uphold his deal with the family in the hopes that this loyalty will be rewarded. Then I'm gonna only ask you for one more thing, Tommy. I don't keep Paulie and Sam around just because they're strong. 
A lot of guys out there bigger and tougher than these two. And they don't keep Frank on the payroll because he's smart. Though he is an artist with the numbers. All these guys in this room, they're here because they have the only thing that matters to me. The only thing that should matter to any of us. You know what that is, Tommy? They're loyal. That's right. And loyalty is what the story in Mafia Definitive Edition is all about. Polly's a hothead, a violent criminal who's also not the brightest tool in the shed, but he's also insecure and filled with complexes. He takes refuge in the promise that his friends and the family will stand out for him when the shit hits the fan. In turn, he's also fiercely loyal and protective of his friends. How you doing, kid? Dino, Lou! You got business with the Don? Nah, we just trying to talk to that cabbie over there, that's all. That right. Yeah. Well, this here's the Don's favorite driver. So anything you got to say to him, you can say to me. Is that right? Well, I'll tell you something, pal. We ain't leaving empty-handed, that's for sure. Well, then maybe you ain't leaving at all. You think he's going to pull this off? He sure is shit gonna kill Galati. Getting off that boat? Well, he's gonna need a guardian angel. He don't need no fucking angel. He's got us looking out for him. You got nothing like that to worry about with Tommy here. He was aces the whole way, boss. You can tell his joy and relief when his friends side with him. Uh, you're already hooked, pal. Maybe. and also his profound disappointment when he learns that he's been lied to and that, though he has remained unconditionally loyal to his friends and to the family, that loyalty has not been a two-way street. Second, we don't deal in the hard stuff. I don't want any dope fiends in this neighborhood. What the hell? Christ. It's dope. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Where are the diamonds? There ain't any. This is the real score. No, 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 no. Don said we would get diamonds. You can open every box. You're not going to find them. We put our fucking necks out on the line for this shit. Looks like it. You better cool off, Polly. The Don's coming. Shit. We don't say nothing about this to the Don. Okay, if he wanted us to know, he would have told us. He should have come clean. Sure. But for now, we keep our trap shut. Right? Yeah, okay. Holly? Yeah. Yeah, I ain't saying nothing. Any problems, boys? One of the crates got a little banged up, he's up. All right? Oh, that doesn't look too bad. Might have lost a few cigars, but otherwise the merchandise should be okay, boss. Besides, ain't diamonds supposed to be the hardest thing around? Outside of my cock, maybe. Well, bravo, boys, bravo. You all got a well-deserved bonus coming your way. You want us to unload the crates into the warehouse? No, you can take a powder. These morons are gonna take it from here. You sure? What I say? Okay, boss. We'll dangle. Sam, give me a lift back to the bar. Sure, boss. You guys coming? Now nah, we'll take the train. Okay. See you later. God damn it. I just about had it, Tommy. If we got busted with all that smack, we would have died in prison. For all its simplicity and straightforwardness, Mafia makes a surprisingly clever use of foreshadowing. And this literary technique is used here to create tension around the concept of loyalty and whether or not it will pay off for the characters. You ever have a dog, Tom? Sure. A little mutt when I was a kid. When I was eight or nine, before I came over from the Sicily, I had this beautiful skinny Cerneco de Letna, like a little greyhound, fastest dog you've ever seen. That's how I met the Don. He started setting up races together. Betting on her with coins and rifle shells. 
There wasn't another dog that could catch her. She never lost. Until the day she did. We were only out of pocket knife, but I never saw the Don so angry. She got old on you? No. Pregnant. She went into heat, got out of the yard, and every dog in town had a turn. You're like that dog, Tommy. Every time you flash your money around, you're a bitch in heat, and everyone in that club is now looking to fuck you. And once you get fucked, you're no good to us. So, uh, what happened to the dog? The Don tried to drown her. I broke his nose. Dogs have always stood as the greatest symbol of loyalty in Western culture. Ina Woolcott puts it this way in her article. The dog's medicine is loyalty, reliability, nobleness, trustworthiness, unconditional love, friendship, fierce energy of protection and service. The Book of Mice and Demand by John Steinbeck is known for its masterful use of foreshadowing. In one passage of the book, some workers of the ranch complain about how Candy's dog had become liability. Not only could he no longer serve his purpose, but he was also making everyone's life miserable with his unbearable stench. I don't mind that dog here stinks, Candy. Got no teeth. It's all stiff from rheumatism. Ain't no good to you. <laughs> Hell, he ain't no good to himself. Why don't you just shoot him, Candy? Why? Well, <laughs> I couldn't do that. I had him too long. A Skinner offers Candy to kill his dog for him if he couldn't bear doing it himself. Candy accepts his companion's offer, and the dog is taken outside and put out of his misery. Later in the story, Candy says this to George. I would have shot that dog myself. I should not let no stranger shoot my dog. This is a grim yet brilliant use of foreshadowing of what's to come for George's friend Lenny. Sometime after Tommy's conversation with Frank, while he's out on a mission to smuggle in some whiskey, he's sent out ahead to look for his buddy Sam and the Canadian liquor smugglers. And this seemingly inconsequential thing happens while he's investigating. What kind of guy shoots a dog? Later in the game, Tommy speaks with Don Solieri, and they have this conversation. Maybe he's still smarting over the dog. But when you tried to drown it. Yeah. <sighs> Same one I shot after he wouldn't let me sink her. The look in Tommy's face says it all. Tommy's wife Sarah is the smart one of the lot. She's well aware of what the world around her is like, and she plays her part. At one point in the story, she has this to say to Tommy. Guess nobody's just one thing, are they? Guess not. I gotta go to work. <sighs> Tom, don't do nothing you don't want to be remembered for, you hear me? Probably too late for that. <laughs> and this was her way of telling him that the only loyalty that's worth pursuing is to one's own principles and ideas. Up until that point, Tommy had been struggling with his own morals. He clearly had not been living by Sarah's advice, choosing his loyalty to the Don and the Salieri crime family whenever he could. And it was Salieri's confession about the dog, what made Tommy realize how much he stood to lose by remaining loyal. And that's when he starts taking different decisions. The story also juggles with other themes, without half any of it. Everything that's brought into the story serves a purpose, like Polly's reaction to Ralphie's comment, which hints at Polly's insecurities and complexes. Hey, genius! <laughs> Get your head out of your ass! <laughs> the fuck, dear, P -P Polly? You can 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 can't just sneak up on a guy like that. Uh, I'm sorry, Ralphie. I'm just busting your balls. <laughs> see, 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 you're still a little limping. Guess we got two, 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 two cripples working here. <laughs> we ain't nothing alike. You got that, Ralph? Show up, Polly. Yeah. Or Detective Clark coming up with the right word. Even Polly had a few rackets of his own. Wasn't exactly happy, but what do you call it? Uh, content. Yeah, that was it. Clark had the word content at the tip of his tongue. His body language also seems to scream. I know very well what you're talking about. 
and hints at the possibility of him also being only content with his own life. But nothing more is said about this, and it doesn't need to, as it wouldn't have added anything to the story. This seemingly inconsequential detail does add some flavor to Clark's character and gives the audience some food for thought. It also helps that the game's lore, though not as deep or broad in scope as some of the other games we've mentioned in our reviews, is littered with relevant references. The real-life assassination of crime boss Paul Castellano at Sparks Steakhouse restaurant in New York, for example, is somewhat represented in Mafia. There's also Tummy Guns, which were the gangster-preferred machine gun back in the old days, and Lubanas, a Sicilian shotgun that was used by peasants to hunt lupos, hence the name, which means wolf, in both Italian and Sicilian dialect. Listen, the story in Mafia Definitive Edition is not perfect. There are some important unanswered questions here and there. There are a few bits that are forcefully written to put Tommy in the spotlight because the player needs to have his or her fun, and a few other things that seem… unlikely. For example, Tommy's fondness of alcohol is glossed over to the point that it's never really clear if he does have a drinking problem. We also never get to experience the supposed consequences of his alcoholism. There's this passage… I hope you all have good taste in whiskey. I ain't really the expert here. Tommy! Oh, yeah. It's fine. And then there's this passage. <laughs> uh, enjoy, huh? I'm glad you're off the roof, Tom. Uh, Sarah threatened to leave me if I didn't dry out. I know. She told you? No. I put her up to it. Drunkards get sloppy, Tom. I didn't want you to make a mistake we couldn't live with. But there's no further mention of Tommy's drinking issues in the game, and it feels like this aspect of his life was haphazardly written into the story. Also, Tommy's reasons for joining the family seem a little bit inconsistent with his character up until that point, and it feels a little bit forced at the beginning of the game. Polly and Sam also seem to be overly comfortable with Tommy rapidly becoming the Don's favorite. They even seem to acknowledge and celebrate his competence, and aside from a few hints from Polly, they don't seem to resent that situation one bit, and I find that a little hard to believe. Also, the assassination attempt on Don Salieri might have referenced Paul Castellano's murder at a Sparks Steakhouse, but Paul Castellano was shot in the head from a close distance before he entered the restaurant. In Mafia, the would-be killers waited until Don Salieri entered the restaurant, and only then they fired their tummy guns on the place in the hopes of getting him killed. I'm no expert assassin, or even amateur, but waiting until your target enters the dining place and then shooting him from outside the restaurant with a machine gun that is known for not being the most precise of a lot seems a bit of a half-assed plan if you ask me. But outside those details, the story fires on all cylinders, and it would be a crime to give it anything less than a perfect score. Graphics. Graphics are probably more important in action games than they are in genres like RPGs or real-time strategy games. As you spend most of your time shooting, fighting, driving, or climbing, so animations have to be tight, Locations have to add to the immersion, and dad tires, weapons, and vehicles need to be artistically cohesive. Mafia delivers on all these aspects. The city of Lost Heaven is huge, and its landscapes are diverse and realistic. Cars look fantastic, and the clothes, oh my god, the clothes. Look at this suit. That's my dream suit right there. I had one like that when I was younger, and it looked like a cheap knockoff of this one. But it's not just Tommy who's a looker. Everyone's clothes are spot on. Their attires are consistent with their statuses and occupations, and they even seem to fit their personalities. Polly, for example, is an ignorant simpleton, not the brightest tool in the shed, and as it happens to every gangster like him, money comes and goes easily. And guys like him tend to be fond of showing off what they have, so Polly likes his suits purple and flashy. Animations are the standout aspect of the graphic package, though, and it's the facial animations that steal the show. We've seen stuff like this before, for sure. We've seen Ellie nod with an expression that clearly expresses that she's not at all convinced of anything she's just been told. We've also seen similar stuff in God of War, Red Dead Redemption, and lots of others. But the facial expressions in Mafia Definitive Edition tell half the story, like those silent, lingering looks of suspicion, digging for a secret or a hint of discomfort, or that sideways glance that you give to someone else, as though scrutinizing the other person's look to see if you find a hint of your own feelings in there or purposefully looking into the distance because you want to avoid someone's look. What I mean is this, if you ever make a gangster movie, you should know that these lingering looks of suspicion and sideways glances are mandatory. They are the bread and butter of non-spoken communication between characters, and even with the audience, and Mafia nails this like no other game I've seen. 
There's also nice little details, like Tommy scratching the back of his neck when he's confused or out of his element. Like this passage, in which he's clumsily trying to impress Sarah. Well, it's, you know, it's a good night for a walk anyway. Don't get yourself killed on my account, Tom. I try to avoid it. That's all you got? You spend all this time with a lady killer like Sam Trapani, and the best line you got is, good night for a walk anyways? <laughs> well, it is, ain't it? Yeah, I guess so. In short, graphics are the story's greatest ally in Mafia Definitive Edition, and they deserve the highest score. Sound effects and mix. This is pretty decent. There's a few treats here, like the sounds of the footsteps changing depending on the surface you're walking on. Or different sounds of vehicle skiddings depending on how fast you're going, the type of car you're driving, and how much you're skidding. or the different sounds bullets make when they strike different surfaces. There's a sound for everything here. Glasses being smashed, guns being fired, Molotov cocktails breaking, and so on and so forth. The mix with the music and voice is excellent too. Gonna take you out. But, and somehow there's always a but with the sound, I think it totally lacks the gravitas and oomph of other action titles, like the Batman Arkham series, or even old ones like Dead Space or The Saboteur. Sound-wise, there's a lot of attention to detail, but there's also a decided lack of bite. Music. There was a lot of effort put into this one. There's different radio stations for you to listen to while you drive, there's badass combat music, and there's a couple of missions in which there's a celebration going on and cool music to go with it. I particularly liked the Tarantella at the end of the racing mission. The music that plays on the radio while you're driving around reminded me of every game in which the main character listens to the radio while doing what he or she has to do. Fallout New Vegas, Wasteland 3, The Saboteur, and well, all those games just seem to have done it better. I remember it being a treat to drive around the Parisian outskirts while listening to the radio in The Saboteur. And it had to do with the way in which this was done in The Saboteur. The songs start playing as though they're coming from the radio and then slowly transition into full-fleshed background tracks. It also helps that the soundtrack is wonderful in this aperture. Mafia is just not in the same league. The best aspect of Mafia's soundtrack is the simplest one though, and it's these very subtle background tunes during the cutscenes that do a wonderful job of stressing the dramatic intention of various passages. Very subtle, but very efficient. I've already mentioned how Mafia Definitive Edition knows how, and also when, to play the game of foreshadowing, and it's not only the writing they use to such end. Take this passage, for example. Yeah, I don't know what it's like for you going home to your wife and kid, but that's why I'm doing this. Who's gonna marry me? Nearly 40 years old and nothing to show for it but my rap sheet. But we do this, I get enough scratch to finally get out. Who knows? You're not built for the domestic life, Bobby. If you're six months in, you'll put a bullet in your brain out of boredom. Christ. I'm ready to punch my ticket right now. We sit around for six months, just playing cards and busting balls, and I start to get lazy. Then everything blows up, and I gotta knock the rust off or I'm dead. 
One day I'm fighting to stay awake while the Don's telling us a story about the old days. One I've already heard a hundred times, and the next day, the next day I'm getting shot at, trying to keep from shit in my pants. It's fucking wearing me out, Tommy. So you're looking for the big one, though. I know, it's a snipe hunt. Every little monster goes to bed dreaming about that last big score. But if we do this thing, I don't know. Might be just enough to get me a little pizzeria or something, you know? I think you can tell that there's no pizzeria waiting for Polly, nor anything else. This didn't need to be stated or even hinted at in any other way. That's where the beauty of the musical score lies. So overall, the music in Mafia Definitive Edition was really, really good, but just short of greatness. Voice acting. You, Michelle. What's it to you? A fella named Sam is one of your regulars. Maybe there's a lot of guys named Sam. You know him. Works for Don Celieri. Maybe you got him talking about our business from time to time, and maybe Don Morello offered you some money to spill what you heard. No, Sam, trust me. I, I don't say nothing. He knows that. Well, the Don's losing a lot of money because someone <laughs> can't keep their mouth shut. I was just bumping cars with some of Morello's girls. I didn't mean nothing by it. Tell him I'm sorry. Tell him I will never open my mouth again. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You're scared then? Good. Don't you ever forget how it feels to be this scared. To know you're just one twitch away from a hole in the ground. Because if you ever show your face in this town again, they're going to find you with two in the head. Do you understand? This is on par with the best films and TV shows out there. The characters in Mafia Definitive Edition just ooze personality, and the actors and actresses' delivery is consistent not only with each character's individual personality, but also with every situation they deal with. In my last review, I mentioned how the protagonist of Desperados 3 was outshined by almost everyone else in the game. This is true of many games. Geralt of Rivia is nowhere near the top actors in The Witcher Saga, and yes, he's meant to be an emotionless, monster-slaying mutant, but so are Lambert and Vesemir, and they do a decent job. Male Commander Shepard is clearly the weak link in the Mass Effect saga, and the same is true of Greedfall, Elex, and several others. Oh, but I'm happy to report that this is very much not the case with Mafia Definitive Edition. Andrew Bongiorno kills it as Tommy D'Angelo. This is one of the most interesting characters in recent memory, and Bongiorno's interpretation is largely to be credited for this, as he takes the player through a tour de force journey of emotions and life-threatening situations. And it's not only Buongiorno who is at the top of his game. Don Stolieri, Sara, Ralphie, Polly, Sam, and everyone else are excellent. And unlike most other games in which you can point out one or two sloppy performances that stain the park, that's not the case here. In short, I was blown away by the acting in Mafia Definitive Edition. Performance and stability. So there is this mission in which you have to steal a customs truck to get into a warehouse. And during my first playthrough, I noticed that for the first time in the game, there wasn't a quest marker for me to follow. Oh my, I thought. The game is finally letting me figure out things on my own. Nah, turns out it was a bug. The second time I played the game, there it was bright and shiny. There was also this car that got wrecked for no reason near Chinatown. And this lever in the old prison that took some fiddling around with to get to work. And that's truly all the issues that I run into with Mafia Definitive Edition. This game is tremendously well optimized. I experienced no crashes and no frame rate drops whatsoever. So aside from those two or three glitches I mentioned, performance was solid. Not perfect, but almost. Other considerations and final thoughts. This was a wasted opportunity. There's no other way to put it. They were so close and yet so far. The story is brilliant, graphics are fantastic, voice acting is top-notch stuff, and the rest of the sound is at the very least competent. But castrating your player and funneling him or her into doing this or that exact thing in this or that exact way without any freedom and also without any secondary content or sandbox mechanics. Especially when you have a city as big as Lost Heaven and so many animations already coded into your characters, it is a criminal waste of resources. 
The fact that when I was not watching a cutscene I was wishing that I had been playing the saboteur should tell you all you need to know about the experience. I'm a little torn with this one. On a vis-a-vis -vis basis, Mafia's good aspects outweigh the bad ones for sure. But being a huge fan of stories about gangsters and organized crime, and seeing how they had everything to make a masterpiece, and how they instead decided to go for a generic action game pisses me off to no end. But hey, in spite of everything, I would still recommend that you check this one out. I just wouldn't want anyone to miss out on this story. I'll leave some other reviews in the description below to help you make up your minds about it. As for me, well that's all I've got for you today. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thank you for watching all the way up until now. If you like what you're seeing in this channel, please consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to avoid the usual YouTube shenanigans. Share the video, but most importantly, never stop gaming, but don't let gaming get in the way of your hopes and dreams. Bye everyone.